there is not a substantial or substantive difference between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, and let me add evangelical Protestantism. And, of course, we strongly disagree with that. And so this study, I know that some of you are thinking long-term about missions. Uh, Some of you love doctrine. But what I'd like to share with you from Galatians chapter 1 is the bigger picture, not worrying about uh, ECT or the gift of salvation right now, but talking about something that impacts the lives of well over one billion people, and that's Roman Catholicism. I will give you in just a few moments seven huge reasons, I call them, why I could never be a Roman Catholic. But I want to say this in a way that that shares it from my heart because I can't think of anything more relevant, anything more profitable than to study not from the newspapers, not to study from polemics, and those are are works that are written attacking things, but to actually study from the scriptures what the scriptures describe as the gospel once and for all delivered to the saints. And seven diametrically opposed tenets of the Roman church, which are as far away from the Bible as you can get, and yet within the context of Christianity, and that's what makes it so dangerous. The Lord Jesus Christ, I trust, will shed his love abroad in our hearts as we truly look at what the Bible teaches and what we believe. There are almost one billion people in this world that claim allegiance to the vicar of Christ, John Paul II. He is the Pontifex Maximus, the high priest, the bridge builder, the prince of the apostles, the bishop of Rome. He's a man from a little town. It's beautiful. It's in southern Poland. His name is John Paul II. And I think it's relevant for you to know what you believe if you're a born-again Christian. For the first reason, because there are a billion people that believe what I'm going to share with you, which is in great opposition to the Bible. And a lot of them don't even know that. Secondly, You probably live next door to someone who's a Roman Catholic. I do. They're all around me in our subdivision. If you work, you probably work along some people that are Roman Catholics. If you have friends, as I do, you have many, like I do, if you make unsaved friends in town who are Roman Catholics. And I'd like to just give you an overview of this series we're going to do by giving you just the seven reasons why I believe I could never be a Roman Catholic, and I trust at the end of this series that as you examine what I am sharing with you from God's Word, that you would also be able to unashamedly, and not in a fighting way, just in in a very calm and assured way, say that you realize that Roman Catholicism is not only wrong, it's deadly and damnable if you believe it and if you practice it. Well... When I say that I want to show you where we're going, these points I'm going to show you, I don't want to be polemical. I don't want to be belligerent. I don't want to be insensitive. Uh, It's not that we want to hurt people. When I explain to you why the Roman Catholic Church, and by the way, I've taken groups there, many groups, uh, seven specific groups I've taken to Rome. We've gone through St. Peter's. In fact, I remember that Bonnie was carrying... Uh, little James, she was six and a half months expecting. I said, honey, I have always wanted to go to the cupola. That's the very top of the St. Peter's. And she walked all 995 steps with me up. And I almost carried her 995 back down. It's not that, that there's anything wrong with the city of Rome. There's nothing wrong with the beautiful St. Peter's. There's, it's not that, that it's bad that there are probably more people that go to church in America that go to Roman Catholic churches than anywhere else. That's not so much the problem. The problem is that the doctrine that they believe is so opposed directly to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what gives me such sadness of heart, that people could be so religious, so surrounded by the truth, and for the most part, never embrace that truth. Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 6. The Apostle Paul is basically has one point in these verses, and that is that there's just one gospel. There aren't many. There aren't uh, multiple versions. There's one gospel. And this is what he says. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel 
which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now look at this, the most serious verse of all, verse 8. But even if I, I and others, we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that we have preached to you, now look at this, let him be, and he uses the word, damned, accursed, forever banished from the presence of God. As I've said before, so now I say it again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. Now, how do we receive the gospel? We received it, delivered to us, under the inspiration of God's Spirit, in this book, in both the Old and New Testaments. God, who in divers' manners in times past has spoken to us through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. And so the Lord Jesus Christ put his seal on the revelation of God as he chose apostles to, to affirm and prophets to speak his word. And so he delivered, and our Lord's brother Jude said, he delivered the faith once and for all for the saints. That is not the gospel that is being dispensed from the Roman Catholic Church. And that's the sadness. There are, and now you can turn back to Revelation 17, there's a dangerous time coming. And I just briefly want to allude to this, and those of you that want to study it in depth, the whole chapter is about the collapse of Satan's church. You see, Satan is busy building a church right now. In the process of looking through this chapter, we find Satan's bride is the delusion of religion. Satan, ever since the Garden of Eden, has been building his church. His church has flourished. Cain was his first member, it says in 1 John 3.12. And ever since, the church of Satan has formed many congregations. You say, really? Are you talking about Anton LaVey and the church of Satan from California? No. His congregations meet in church buildings, in synagogues, in mosques, in cathedrals, and in temples. Everywhere where organized religion stresses that you, through your human working, can achieve your way to God. That's religion. Religion says that man can achieve and make himself acceptable to God. God has revealed that there is nothing that we can do that is righteous. Nothing. And therefore, we cannot achieve God's favor we can only accept and receive the merits of Christ on our behalf. It's imputed. It's not received one dose at a time, which is the heartbeat of Romanism. Jesus came to seek and to save. He gave himself to purchase us from sin and damnation. He lives as our great high priest to purify and to cleanse us from all defilement. And we are to be his pure and chaste virgin, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now turn back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, please, because the Apostle Paul warned us that there would be something that would, would be an impediment to us being a pure and holy bride to Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 11, he warned us in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 11 that there are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles for Christ or, or of the gospel of Christ. Look at verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Satan's greatest realm of activity is in organized religion. There are more people going to hell because of religion than there are because of any of the sins of the flesh, lustful things, Pride, arrogance, materialism, those things are not as damnable as false religion. And that's what we'll see of our study of Romanism. In the 17th chapter of Revelation that, that we studied, we saw the culmination of Satan's false system. Well, there are seven specific biblical reasons why I believe that Roman Catholicism is anti-biblical and also wrong. These seven are, first of all, the Mass. And we're going to study the Mass briefly. The second reason, I believe, is Mary and the role of Mary. The attributing to Mary divine attributes. In fact, I just wanted to make sure this afternoon I went to the main Catholic site, the Sacred Heart site, and I went there and I checked. And they, as of about 4.30 this afternoon, are still ascribing to Mary divine attributes. They pray 
have prayers to her. They ask her to be with them. She is a human. She is in one place at one time. She cannot hear me talking. She cannot hear you talking. She can hear no one praying. She cannot help. She cannot save. She cannot plead. She cannot intercede. She cannot offer any type of remission of temporal or even greater than temporal punishment. And yet, unabashedly, the Catholic Church, post-Vatican II Church, offers to Mary prayers that are on the level of the divine. We'll see that when we study Mary. That's the second reason why I could never be a Roman Catholic. Thirdly, the third reason is that the Roman Church elevates tradition over the Word of God. Time after time, if you boil it down and talk to a Roman Catholic person and find out what they believe, they will only go so far with you with this book. And then they will say, the corpus magisterum, the body of the teaching of the church, says, and that takes precedence over the word of God. And thus it makes us no longer the divine, inerrant, infallible, inspired, once and for all settled in heaven, word of God. That's a very dangerous place to be because God has spoken. The tradition of Rome usurps the scriptures. The traditions of the church are 1600, of the Roman church, are 1600 years old, and they are so growing and, and, and metamorphosizing that truly, if, if the people that study this book in Romanism paid attention to it, they would cut all that tradition off. But the church tradition has grown to the same place, and we'll see that and examine that. Fourthly is idols, the veneration or the worship of images. And uh, even though uh, officially the Roman Catholic Church does not believe in idols, if you go to any Roman Catholic shrine or any Roman Catholic church, if you go to the Vatican itself, and we were just there uh, last May, and when we were there, there were just countless people that would grieve your heart that were, were kissing, stroking, kneeling, weeping, praying, adoring, every word you want to use, images of people, the saints, Mary, Peter, little pictures of the mother, child, Mary, and, and Jesus, and a few pictures of Christ or images. But God hates idols. He hates any physical representation of him. He hates all worship that is human, contrived, and human formed. In fact, I, I shared this week, I was at a meeting where someone said, could you, could you explain to me the essence of what's wrong with Romanism? I said, yes. If I came in and I was dying of diabetes and someone came and gave me an insulin shot, which, which temporarily relieved it, that would be going to the Roman Catholic Church. I would still be dying. I would be no better off. I would just continue my dying. If I came dying of diabetes to Christ, he would give me a brand new body and I would be cured from it one time totally done, and I would live forever. That is the difference between the gospel and Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism infuses grace one insulin shot at a time, or they think they're infusing grace. And infused grace is dispensed by the church through the sacraments. And there are seven sacraments, and it's a, a production line. You, you At baptism, you, you have all of your sins up until that point, and until your confirmation uh, taken care of, and you begin your spiritual life, and then at your confirmation, you get your next dose, and then every time you come to Mass, you keep getting every dose after that. And you keep going up until you commit a sin, and then you fall back. And if it's a, a mortal sin, you fall back way back to the beginning, uh, and you have to start over again. And it's an idea of dispensing grace like insulin shots. And the sacraments are a, a terrible, terrible travesty to the Word of God. The sixth reason why I am not, nor could be, a Roman Catholic is... and. I couldn't think of any other way to state it than the lie of purgatory because the idea is that Jesus did not sufficiently pay for our sins on the cross and so you have to do a partial payment. It's kind of like your folks put part of the money down for the car but you've got to work off the rest. When, or, or when we buy a house, we put a down payment, we've got to make the mortgage payments. And Jesus said that he paid the entire price of our sins once and for all. The Roman Catholic Church says, no, he wasn't able to. He needs the assistance of his mother. He needs the assistance of the saints. And you've got to cooperate. And you have to, you'll never make it all the way through. And so you have to go to 
to purge. That's what purgatory is, purging. You, you're not quite clean enough for heaven because Jesus did not cleanse you completely, uh, sufficiently. His sacrifice is insufficient, so you have to go to purgatory. In fact, I was reading this afternoon, looking over this material, and when I got to my Sunday Missal, my prayer book, uh, that I have in my library, I opened it up, and lo and behold, there was a card from, I bought it at the Goodwill, from someone who had, through buying a candle or something, bought 300 days out of purgatory for an individual. And I have their name. I have the card. And, and you know, when you read that, or when you go to a funeral, and, and, and it's a Catholic funeral, and they, they give out those little cards for you to do masses, that's all to buy people out of purgatory. And we'll look at that whole, where it came from, and What's wrong with it? And finally, the seventh reason is the incredible role of paganism in the Roman Catholic Church. Let me just share this with you. Have you ever wondered how we went from Peter and, and uh, James and John and Andrew and the apostles and Jesus running around Galilee in a boat, and nobody having anything, and Jesus said that everybody, foxes have holes and I don't have a place to lay my head? How did we go from a bunch of fishermen and a carpenter preaching the gospel to robes and beads and candles and prayers and images and bones and relics and orders of priests and orders of monks and orders of nuns and and hierarchy of cardinals, bishops and cardinals and the pope. How did we get to all that? All of it can be traced back to the syncretism. You know what syncretion is? It's, It's taking the elements of other religions and blending them together into a new one. And Romanism in about the 4th century, in 313 A.D., in that period of time, succumbed to the world around it and embraced all of the priests of the false religions of the world. And that's where the robes, and that's where the candles, and that's where the beads, and that's where the images, and that's where Lent came from, and that's where all of the various pagan elements of Romanism came from. They were all inculcated in the 4th century, and we'll... Kind of, that's probably one of the most fascinating parts where that all came from. Well, those are the seven reasons. The Roman Catholic Church is an amalgam. It's a syncretion. It's a blending together of nearly all the major elements of the world religion. That's why today the Bishop of Rome, John Paul II, is constantly involved in interfaith dialogues with every type of religion on the planet. Everything. There's nothing left out. He has had interfaith dialogues with all of them because they're finding that they all have something in common. And that is that they all believe that there's something we can all do to get to heaven or wherever they're thinking they're going. And so that's the idea the Pope is working together with them. But before I actually get into these problems with the Mass, I want to assure you that I know and love some dear born-again Roman Catholics. Now, some of you might be shocked by that. To even say that's a difficult thing because it's like saying a a communist American or, or it's like saying things that don't go together. But I'll explain to you who my friends are. I do know and count among my good friends born-again Roman Catholics. In fact, some of them are my closest spiritual advisors, people that I look to on almost a daily basis to understand the Bible. But let me underline one word. They were Roman Catholics. And you'll understand what I mean in a moment. They all went through all the interesting and different movements uh, of the Mass, and if you, if you ever read a mass book, it would boggle your mind everything that they do, how they have to turn here, turn there, do this, do that, cross themselves five times, four times this way, seven times back, lift the host, do this and that. These were all involved with that. These former Roman Catholic priests were at one time ordained, mass offering, host elevating, pope following Roman Catholic priests. And I think you know them too, because they all became famous when they left the church. In fact... They were baptized, as 98% of all Roman Catholics are, into the church. They were priests. They were totally immersed in the church, up over their head, until the day they started reading the Bible. And when they read the Bible, it changed their life. The first one's name was John Wycliffe. And after he was saved in the 14th century, someone read his testimony by the name of John Huss. And he was saved in the 15th century. And then two men read his testimony after he was burned at the stake. And their names were Martin Luther and John Calvin. And collectively, those four men are great mentors to me as I read their works. But all four of them saw the horrors of the errors of Romanism, and they turned from them. 
So basically what I'm saying to you is that there's nothing wrong with a person on the other side of your fence who's a Roman Catholic. You can trust them. You can love them. They could be your neighbors as my neighbors are. You can give them the keys to your house and your car. You can trust whatever you want to to them. They're not bad. At least they're not any more evil than the rest of us who were born wicked sinners. But the problem is they're lost. And what's even worse than that is they probably don't even know it because they have been inoculated by something that's got a package that resembles the Word of God around it. And much like when you and I get a polio vaccine or a DPT shot or whatever, you get just enough of that disease to build up an antibody so that you will not get a full-blown contagion of that illness. So many Roman Catholics have gotten just close enough to the Word of God, just close enough to the power of God, just close enough to the God of the Scriptures that they are almost inoculated to the truth. And that's the horror. Well, let's turn now to the book of Hebrews, and we'll start in chapter 9. And what I'm going to share with you is just the first reason why Romanism is so deadly, why it's so abominably wrong. And that, of course, is the error of the mass. And just because Romanism is deadly, and, and just because there's some close friends of ours and maybe even relatives that are involved, and maybe your, your neighbor or maybe you're in a Bible study, just because of that, I don't want to be at all appearing light because we're talking about the souls of individuals that we work with, that we live with, that we're related to, that we live around. And so, therefore, I would, in the words of the Apostle Paul, relate to him when he said, by the space of three and a half years, he said to the Ephesians, I did not cease to warn you. And he said, even with tears. If we really, really thought about it deeply enough, I think that all of us would weep for those who with their whole heart have a form of godliness, but by and large the vast majority have denied the power. Now, I'm not saying there's not a single born-again Roman Catholic, but I would say it's in spite of Romanism. And if they at all are conscious what the Bible says, and if they listen at all to the Mass, they will not stay a Roman Catholic. They will begin to make their departure. Because every time the Mass is performed 200,000 times today, the Mass was performed at altars of Roman Catholic churches around the world 200,000 times today. Every time the Mass is performed, the name of Jesus Christ, the character of Jesus Christ, the atoning work of Jesus Christ is blasphemed. You know, I said to someone this week, I was talking about it, I said, you know, you're recently married. I said, what would you think if your wife was deaf and you walked into a room and everyone was smiling at your wife and was cursing her and disparaging her and blaspheming her would you continue standing in that room as they mocked her and she was deaf to it? Of course not. Your wife, you love her, you would take her out of that setting. In fact, you would even be quite upset. I would be with, with my wife. If anybody treated her that way, talked that way, I would defend her at all costs. And yet there are countless people who seemingly are deaf as they go to the Mass that I'm going to describe and as they listen to the, to the utter blasphemy that Jesus did not pay at all, that I do not all owe my salvation to him, that Jesus did a down payment, and I've got the mortgage, and I've got a lifetime to work it off. And even then I won't be done paying for it, which is, as the Apostle Paul said, another gospel, which is those that preach it shall be accursed. Let's look at the Mass just briefly, because the first reason, the only one we can cover, that Roman Catholicism is false and anti-Christian is because of the Mass. I say this uh, very carefully, but no doctrine in the world is more damnable than the doctrine of transubstantiation. You say, what is that? That is the heart of the Roman Church. It's the re-crucifying of Jesus Christ at every Mass in every church around the world every day. It's called transubstantiation. The gold cup 
of Revelation 17, where we were briefly, is a picture of a false and vile counterfeit. And, and uh, the, the picture of Revelation 17 is of a drunken woman, and it says that, that she has in her hand this cup of wine in verse 2, and she's getting everybody intoxicating, intoxicated. Verse 4, it says, This cup is full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Well, one of the, the most damnable things is having the abominations of the mass that is so pagan. Let me just read to you, and, and a lot of this is just so uh, difficult to comment on without reading what they say. Let me read to you from the Roman Catholic history books. By the way, everything I quote uh, is from the Catholic Catechism. And if you want to ever witness your Catholic friend, don't, don't hand them Dave Hunt. You know, they will not appreciate it. You know, what you do is you, you get a Roman Catholic Catechism that is numbered from 1 to, you know, 2,900, 3,100. I'm not sure how high it goes. I haven't looked at the back of it. But every doctrine that's catechized, that is codified, that is taught in the church is in that catechism. And what you do is you allude to, and, and I'm going to do that in just a second, to what the scriptures say and what the catechism says. And just point it out. And then ask the God of all grace and mercy to move their hearts towards salvation as they see the error. But it's shocking for most Roman Catholics to learn that the proposal of the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice, this transubstantiation, bloodless sacrifice, which the Mass is, was first made by a Benedictine monk by the name of Radbertus in the ninth century. You see why we can sing songs of Roman Catholics from the 4th century, the 5th century, the 6th century, the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century? Do you know why we can do that? Because up until the 9th, the 12th, and the 17th century, or the 16th century, Rome had not come to any type of, of organized doctrine. It was kind of real, everybody doing whatever they want, and kind of Rome had it together, the city, but not the whole church. But in the ninth century, a Benedictine monk out in some monastery somewhere began promoting the idea that the Catholic Church could change the bread and the cup into the literal body and blood of Christ. It just shocked them all. And fierce debates broke out. And for 300 years, there were fierce verbal battles among the bishops. Every city had a bishop. There was a bishop of Rome, a bishop of Ephesus, a bishop of Constantinople, a bishop of Jerusalem, a bishop of Alexandria. You know, they were just all over the place. And these men would gather, hundreds of them, at synods and councils, and they would fight back and forth and debate this until finally the most powerful of all the popes, Pope Innocent III, who, by the way, was more like General Patton than a pope. I mean, he was a conqueror. He just had armies, and he was just subjugating Europe. And on the side, he was the pope. But he finally said, I don't want any quibbling. I declare it to be official Roman doctrine, 1215 A.D. And all of a sudden, the mass was born full-blown. And all of a sudden, they began to go exactly contrary to Hebrews chapter 9. And let me show you what I mean, starting in verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Uh, I just had someone recently I was talking to. I was sharing the gospel. Actually, I was talking to someone else, witnessing to an unsaved person. And another person I didn't know very well was standing there. And I got through the first point that we have all sinned. When this person piped up and says, oh, by the way, you know, I've met God. I said, well, I have too. No, literally, they said, I met I saw his arm. Right away, I knew that they hadn't because God doesn't have an arm. You know what I mean? And so I, I knew they'd seen Satan's arm and thought it was God. And, and what I saw there was a denial of verse 27. It's appointed for men to die once, but after this, a judgment. This person said, I, I've, I've died already. I'm back to life. I've seen God. And they said, as I was sharing with this lost sinner, the gospel, they said, you don't even have to worry about that because, because when I died, I found out that everything is going to be peaceful. And, and when I died, all I saw was white light and this arm coming to me, beckoning me to come. You've all read about this if you read the Inquirer at all. This happens every week somewhere in the United States. Satan fools people all the time. And, and, and they, they come out of these experiences. In fact, Betty Eady wrote a book about it. Uh, and, and it's a best-selling book. And, and it's called Embraced by the Light. And the problem is she embraced the light of 2 Corinthians 11, which is Satan. And her God of her book is Satan and not the God of the Bible. But this, this idea that, that we die once and face the judgment is denied by the cults. But the Roman church doesn't have a problem with that. They say, right, one death and judgment 
But look at verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Now, let me ask you a question. From that Bible study, how many times was Christ offered? Well, what is the Mass? It's a bloodless re-crucifixion of Christ. And so the heart of the gospel is that Jesus, in one sacrifice forever, have perfected all who come to God through him. And the Roman church says, no. Starting in 1215 A.D., Christ has to be crucified over and over, and they're up to 200,000 times a day. Can you calculate how many millions of times Christ has had to die, and he still hasn't made it? He still hasn't paid and atoned for the sins of the world? Well, the very principles found in the bloodless sacrifice of the Mass, as it is in the Church of Rome today, could be traced directly, if you want to read the Encyclopedia Britannica, back through the labyrinth of paganism to the fountain of idolatry in ancient Rome. And Rome's most blasphemous and massive religious fraud originated in Babylonian worship. And as we know, it will continue until Revelation 17. Well, Romanism, first of all, is false because of the Mass. And I'd like to read to you from the Creed of Pope Pius IV. You can look this up in your catechism. He summarized the findings of the Great Council of Trent. And in his fifth article, which is in any library in this country, this is what it says, Article 5, the Mass. You now, this is written in 16th century English. It's kind of different, but you'll get the idea. In the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist, there is truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt what he's saying. He's saying that when you walk up front at the altar of a Roman church and you have in front of you, actually, I guess they turn around and they have their back to the audience, they come up that altar and they hold up the host. They're saying that they're holding the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of Jesus Christ right there. That's astounding. For them to believe that all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in a wafer is astounding. But they don't stop there. Let me keep reading from Pius IV. And that there is made a conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood, which conversion the Catholic Church calls transubstantiation. I also contest, the Pope says, that under each kind alone Christ is received whole and entire and a true sacrament. Now, that's official, and that's the end of the quote. It's an official writing of one of the popes of Rome, which has never been abrogated. It's not been set aside. It hasn't been lessened. It hasn't been diminished. Vatican II only reaffirmed the absolute concurrence of the entire church with the College of Cardinals and all the bishops of the whole world that the Catholic Church has always believed in the changing of the bread, those little wafers that an order of nuns makes somewhere in different parts of the world, and that wine that they have in the front is wholly and entirely changed. Now, how do they change it? This little church history note here. In the Middle Ages, in Europe, a priest would come walking out carrying this host, and he would set it on the table in front of all these peasants that worked in the fields, all week long, and this guy was wearing this glittering gold-fibered robe and this big headdress and a cross and sometimes jewels on it. And he'd come out, and he'd carry this, and he'd set it down. And they could recognize that that was bread, and they knew that was wine. And then the fellow would go in Latin, hoc est corpus meum, and he would go through. Hoc means this, est means is, corpus means body, meum means my. It's Latin. He said, this is my body. He'd go like that, and he'd elevate it several times. He'd set it down, and he would adore it. And you know what? Those people thought, that is amazing that that man can turn just bread from the bakery into Jesus, and he could turn wine from the keg out there into his blood. And they didn't know Latin. And so what they started doing is started going hocus pocus, hocus. And that's where the whole magic called hocus pocus comes from. To think that you could change that into the body and blood of Christ became the most amazing thing of the Middle Ages. And so that's where alchemy came from. The idea of transmuting stuff to gold, uh, iron to gold. And that's where all of the, the medieval magical arts came from because the church was in front of the very face of the world doing hocus pocus. And actually, that's all they were doing. There's no mere man. You say, how does a priest change the, the bread 
and the wine into the body of Christ. That's called ex opere operato. That's another Latin, which means through the operation comes the operation. You say ex opere operato. It's the same word. Yeah, they said it's not inherent in the priest. It's through the operation of elevating the host that the change takes place if you do it within a Catholic church and follow the prescribed ritual, which is a little bit of circular reasoning, but it doesn't matter. It became that a, a very unholy priest could all of a sudden stand in front of a holy place and lift a common cup and embody in his hands the soul, the divinity, the body, and the blood of Jesus Christ. That would truly be a miracle if he could do it. Well, Vatican II changed no dogmas. Vatican II only updated the errors of Romanism. After the priest and the congregation watched this hocus-pocus stuff, this is what they say. After the words of consecration, hocus corpus meum, the priest kneels down and adores the sacred host. You ever been in a Roman church? You ever seen them do that? They turn around, they do this thing, and then they bow on their knee. What are they doing? They're worshiping the cracker and the cup. That's what they're doing. But what do they think they're doing? They're adoring Jesus Christ because they have bodily formed him right there. They have just re-sacrificed him. They have just made him go through all the, they think, through all the agonies of the cross. They have made him go through the separation from God. They've made him go through the, the shedding of his blood. They've made him go through bearing the sins of the world. And they've done it right on the spot, just like that. And so they get down on their knees and they adore him. Now, listen, it doesn't stop there. And this goes on 200,000 times a day. After they kneel and adore the sacred host, they rise, they turn and elevate the consecrated host. And with faith and piety, as much as they can muster, they say to the host, my Lord and my God. If that is an idolatry, I don't know what is. That's just the beginning of the Mass. That's not even the fullness of everything that they say. Well, is the Mass in the Scriptures? Of course not. Uh, the, the words are, my Lord and my God, you all recognize that. That was the greatest confession of all by Thomas. When, when, he, was gonna, when he was asked to plunge his hand in the side of Christ and, and to feel the nail holes, he couldn't even do it. He just fell on his feet in front of Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. He didn't fall in front of a picture of him. He didn't fall in front of wafer and cup. Well, the problem with Romanism is that Rome always materializes the spiritual. And what Roman, the Roman Catholic Church has done with the Mass is they've materialized a spiritual truth. They have made into an object which cannot be comprehended. Uh, I mean, they have made into an object that can be comprehended the incomprehensible sacrifice of Christ. They have taken the immaterial, the, the once and for all sacrifice for Christ, and they've materialized it into a operation that they can transport around the world and they take what everybody knows was just a wafer pancake and the priest which by the way in the middle ages many and i'm not being critical many priests in the middle ages were living dissipated lives see how do you know that you ever heard of chaucer canterbury tales middle age britain the Canterbury Tales are stories about the Roman Catholic Church and people on pilgrimages, and it talks about the debauchery and the drunkenness and the, the vile lives, and it's a, a parody, and it's a historical fiction, but yet behind the fiction is a lot of truth. And you know what Chaucer said about the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages? He said, if the gold doth rust, what will the iron do? You say, what does that mean? He says, if the churchmen, who are supposedly gold, are so corrupt, what are common people like? And so those commoners would look at that, at that dissipated priest, and, and there are just as many dissipated Protestant priests and clergymen, I'm sure, as there are Roman, but those people that would see him, and they knew how he lived all week long, and as they saw him walk into the cathedral and take a piece of normal bread, and by going hocus corpus me, I'm changing into Jesus, they'd say, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. And so they became enchanted even with the process and not with the person. Well... Let me read a little bit more from the Council of Trent, and then I want to take you on a journey through the scriptures. This is when Rome got to write down exactly what they believed from 1545 to 1564. This is what they said. They made 120 affirmations. Trent, the Council of Trent, has 120 affirmations of Roman Catholic doctrine. And this is what they said. In this divine sacrifice, and I'm talking about the priest holding on to this host, 
is contained and immolated in an unbloody matter, the same Christ who once offered himself in a bloody matter. So it's not us blaming them. That's exactly what they want to do. They say, we are taking Jesus who offered himself once in a bloody matter, and we are going to immolate and offer him in an unbloody matter constantly. Why? This is what it says. Continuing, I'm just reading from the Council of Trent, from your library. This is truly propitiatory, for the victim is one and the same. Now he offers himself by the ministry of priests, not for the sins of the faithful who are living, or not only for the sins of the faithful who are living, but also for those who departed in Christ and were not yet fully purified. What does that mean? They died in their sins. It's what Jesus called it. And what he's saying is they're still suffering in purgatory. And so the Mass purports to have efficacious salvation attachments, not just for the people that sit out there and watch this, but who are required to come at least once a year, but also for the people that are dead to help them get to heaven. And that's why I wrote these words. Do you understand that Romanism is the most magnificently crafted religion for humans? Think about it. What if Uncle Zeke died an alcoholic, a drunkard, and you know didn't quite make it? It's okay. You can burn candles and have masses said for him. And if you do enough, Uncle Zeke will someday make it to heaven. Isn't that a great religion? You never have to worry about anybody not making it. It was a religion designed for humans. Because we don't like thinking about their people are going to deny Christ and they're going to spend an eternity in conscious torment because they died in their sin. And so Romanism says that's too bleak. It's too difficult. We have something else for you. I know that's oversimplifying it. But that's really what it's about. It's very sad. Last thing from Trent. The decrees of Trent say, A true and a real sacrifice is not offered to God by priests who offer Christ's body and Christ's blood, or that the sacrifice of the Mass is not a propitiatory one. If anyone ever says that that is true, they are damned. That's called an anathema. In other words, what they said is, if you don't believe that the priests are re-offering Jesus Christ, then you don't go to purgatory, you go to hell. And that's the bottom line of the Catholic Church. Well, Take your Bibles with me, and I want to show you something, starting in uh, 2 Corinthians 4. What I'm going to give you is uh, just the beginning of, of a little way to share the gospel in the next nine minutes with maybe your friends that, that uh, don't know the Lord yet. Because uh, a Christian, first of all, is a person, and, and I'm just reading a, a standard how to witness to your Catholic neighbor track. You can find them anywhere. But I want you to actually go through this. Sometimes we read stuff and we don't study. But look at 2 Corinthians 4, 2. It says, But we, this is a Christian, has renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But we manifest ourselves, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So what is the Bible to us? It is the ultimate authority. Uh, you all know this verse, uh, 2 Timothy, if you want to turn over there, 3, 16. It says this, all scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, not, not all church tradition, but all scripture, the holy writings, are given by inspiration of God. They are profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Okay, that's what a Christian is. Now, what, what does a Roman Catholic believe? They believe that the church has authority over scripture. So I'll read, this is what the catechism says. Paragraph 119. The manner of interpreting the scriptures is ultimately subject to the judgment of the church, which exercises the divinely conferred commission and ministry of watching over and interpreting the word of God. You know what that is? That effectively robs normal people of this book. You know why? It's too dangerous. Now, the Catholic Church has a little bit changed their tack. Now they're promoting Bible studies. In fact, I just went up to Harvard and... 31st or wherever the Roman Catholic bookstore is, and I walked in, and, and I was just acting real interested, and the man says, you know, you're so interested. He says, you need this track, how, how to be sure you're saved. I said, thank you. He said, that'll be 25 cents. I said, well, thank you. I paid him a quarter for it. We give him away, but he was, you know, he had a whole box of me. He was selling it. He's supposed to. It was a store. 
They said, you should read that. And I did. You know what it says? It says, you can be sure you're saved if you have been baptized and if you've been confirmed and if you are faithful in your attendance to Mass at least once a year and if you are, did you catch that? And so when I read my Bible, if I was trying to be saved, I would say, that doesn't agree. And you know what they would say? The church has been divinely commissioned to interpret the Word of God. Trust us. You see the difference between a Christian and a Roman Catholic? A Christian says, I have the anointing from God. I can understand this book. God has opened my eyes. He's turned me from darkness to light. And I, formerly when I was lost, it was foolishness. 1 Corinthians 2.14. But now that I'm born again, it's not foolish anymore. I understand this book. Well, what about salvation itself? Turn to uh, Romans 4, 5, back to the left there in your Bibles. And I just want to do a few contrasts because, honestly, any truly seeking Roman Catholic, if you will, will not frontally attack them, I mean, you don't have to tell them about Radbertus and tell them it's an abomination. Uh, it's all true. But I would start with what... What is the basis of our salvation? And, and look at, at Romans 4, 5 with me. This is what it says in Romans 4 and verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. It's the whole faith chapter about Abraham and justification by faith. So a Christian believes that they have been justified by faith because justification, once and for all, is a declaration from God. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 30. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God, God justifies the wicked, and his faith as credited as righteousness. Now, that's what the Bible says. That's just plain Bible. A Roman Catholic, paragraph 1446 of the Catechism, has to be justified repeatedly by sacraments and works because he loses the grace of justification each time a mortal sin is committed. The sacrament of penance offers a new possibility to convert and to recover the grace of justification. Which even reading it is confusing. Basically what it says is you're hooked. That's what it means. You've got to come in for your insulin. You've got to jab yourself with the needle several times a day and keep getting your insulin or you're going to have an attack and die. You see? You see what... Jesus says, a new heart I'll give you and a new spirit, and you'll once and for all be eternally saved. And they say, no, nope, you've got to come in, you've got to keep taking your injections, and every time you miss an injection, you go back to start, and you've got to start over again. At the very heart, Romanism is exactly diametric, exactly in opposition to the heart of the gospel. How does regeneration occur? We have time, three minutes for just two more. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13 with me at the work of regeneration. It says this, and this is good doctrine for us. And by the way, all these verses are already in yellow in my Bible. I hope they are in yours. And I would encourage you as this series goes on, you might want to uh, do something that I do. In the back of my Bible, I, I have these little lists. And, and I put down like Roman Catholicism. And I'll, I'll just jot off some, some verses so that, you know, if, if I'm sitting next to someone or talking to my neighbor and have my Bible, at least I know where to start. And I have my Bible marked. And I would encourage you to somehow... You know, grab a pen and bring it and, and, and study this together. But look at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 12. It says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all are made to drink into one Spirit. So we believe that we were regenerated at the baptism of the Spirit when we were born again. And at that moment we were baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. And from the beginning... And, and keep turning to the right to 2 Thessalonians, because this is, this is a tremendous verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And by the way, this is Paul talking to a very new church, and he talked about very deep stuff. And 2 Thessalonians 2.13 explains regeneration. And it says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, because God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. We believe the Spirit sanctified. God initiates and we respond in salvation. God is the initiator. So we believe that God from the beginning chose us to be saved by the sanctifying work of the Spirit and we became one who believes and loves the truth. That's what a born-again Christian is. That's what we are.
The book of life is a listing of those who are going to be worshipers of God. They won't worship anything else. The beast, the antichrist, none of that. They won't worship false worship, but they will worship God in the spirit. Well, the book of life also is a group of people who have received a love for the truth. You know, it says earlier in, in First Thessal- or Second Thessalonians, it says they did not receive the love of the truth. Uh, and, and that's what happens to lost people. But what do Catholics believe? Paragraph 694 of their confession says this. A Roman Catholic believes baptism of water imparts divine life. Baptism of water imparts divine life. And the water of baptism signifies our birth into divine life. What does it say? God has chosen you from the beginning through the sanctification of the Spirit and through belief of the truth. Can a baby be sanctified by the Spirit? No. They can be from the womb set apart to God like Jeremiah the prophet was, but they can't be saved. They have to believe the truth themselves. And no autism can materialize the work of the Spirit. Well, last verse, favorite one. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. What, what a, aren't you glad for Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, and you can take that both ways. The faith not of ourselves, and the gift is not of ourselves, and the grace is not of ourselves. You can just, it, none of it is of ourselves. It's not of works, is the bottom line, verse 9, lest anyone would ever have a reason to say to God, <laughs> aren't you glad I made it? <laughs> right? I, I, I did it all, didn't I? See, that's the idea of religion. God, aren't you glad how much I did? But that's not the God of grace. He says, no, my grace is sufficient. There's nothing you can do. So a born-again Christian is saved by the unmerited grace of God. It is by grace we've been saved. It is by faith in the work of Christ. It's not something we've done that's right or good. It is totally a gift that we received. It's not by works so that no one can boast. Uh, just a few weeks ago when I was uh, up speaking to the young people in northern Michigan, uh, I had all these inner city kids. It was very interesting, and I remember scaring them to death. I walked out to the front and stuck my pen right into the face of one of them. I said, I want to give you this gift. Here you go. You can have it. What should you do? And the guy's eyes got real big. He says, take it. I says, yep. And he took it, and I said, that'll be $10 scared him to death. I said, that's religion. You pay your way as you go. But God says he gives you the gift, and all you say is, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. That's a true Christian. What is Roman Catholicism? A Roman Catholic is saved by meriting the graces needed for salvation. We can merit for ourselves and for others the grace needed for the attainment of eternal life. And that's not my words. That's paragraph 2010, 2010 of their catechism. And they literally believe if they are a good practicing Roman Catholic, that they can merit grace for themselves and attain eternal life. 